Hi, I think we'll start now and whoever comes in later can just join us late. Uh, welcome to the Institute of World Politics. My name is Paul Coyer. I'm a research professor here. For those of us that are not familiar with IWP, we are not a think tank. Um, we are a graduate school of uh, foreign policy and national security. Um, we have a number of interesting speakers throughout the year, and we're privileged today to have a gentleman of a, of a, with a, an incredible background. Uh, Peter is currently at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, previous to that, he's done a lot of interesting things. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School, which I do not hold against him. We were talking earlier, I did uh, some coursework at Yale Law School. Um, he's a good guy anyway. Um, he was a uh, White House counsel for Ronald Reagan in the 80s. Um, <clears throat> he's also a specialist, among other things, in, um, in uh, regulation and deregulation of financial services, which, is, which background has formed the basis for this book, Hidden in Plain Sight, What Really Caused the World's Worst Financial Crisis and Why It Could Happen Again. I will let him talk about the, uh, go through the argument with you. But in short, this is a book that everyone needs to read. Uh, not many people know this story. It is indeed what actually happened uh, when people talk about the, the Wall Street uh, securitizing uh, these mortgages and, and everything they did. That happened within an environment, and a regulatory environment that made it possible for all that to happen. When you ignore that, you really miss most of the story. So without further ado, please welcome uh, Peter Wallison, and we'll look forward to hearing what he has to say. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Um, I'm going to talk about the causes of the financial crisis. Paul didn't mention that I was also a member of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, which was appointed after the financial crisis by Congress for the purpose of telling the American people and Congress and the president why we had a financial crisis. And uh, I dissented from their report. Their report fit in with the narrative that we've all heard, that we hear every day, uh, and that is that the financial crisis was caused by excessive risk-taking, greed by the financial system, primarily the, uh, the banks on Wall Street. Um, I dissented because I had an entirely different view of what caused uh, the financial crisis, and it was not lack of regulation of the financial system, it was U.S. government housing policy. And what I will try to do today is to explain to you how all of this could have happened. But it is, it is fairly remarkable in a country where we get an awful lot of news, an awful lot of um, argument back and forth about major events that occur. And here we have a financial crisis that was by most accounts, almost the same thing as uh, the Great Depression, uh, or the events leading up to and including the Great Depression. And we get only one side of the story about what happens. And indeed, it's a side of the story without any essential evidence. Um, so I'm sure that one day, scholars will go back and want to find out why we had a financial crisis. And the book that I'm going to tell you about now, I might not be around for it, but some scholar will find it and say, you know, there is this other story about the financial crisis that actually we didn't, no, I would never heard about before. Let's look into this. Uh, because it is, it's the story with the evidence and the data. It is not the story that was simply picked up by the media as they were told by the government, and as they were told by people who are interested in regulating further our economy. Um, they picked it up and have talked about it, and it's the only thing that is known. So you will be privileged, as it were, <laughs> to uh, see a different side of the story, and you can decide for yourselves whether you think it's true. If you want more detail, it's in the book. And the book actually is the only um, version, only story about the financial crisis that has the data that demonstrates that it, um, that the, 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 th the theory that I was pursuing is, is correct. All the other stories about the financial crisis are very, very thin, but the book 
contains a lot of data that I got as a member of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and were, was not used by the FCIC because they were focused entirely on the, um, on the regular narrative, which is that it was caused by risk-taking um, and insufficient regulation of the financial system. So let's kind of get started here and uh, you can see uh, at least the basics. Now, I've told you that we are told that it was the private sector that caused the problem. And what you are looking at here is what, uh, is what the economy or at least the uh, mortgage system looked like just before the financial crisis. We're all told, and this is, this is true, that the crisis was caused by um, uh, a buildup of subprime and other low quality mortgages in our financial system. And uh, then a meltdown occurred. And the question is, why uh, did we have so many subprime and other low quality mortgages in the financial system? What you see here on the left is, oh, on the left and the right, are all of the subprime and high risk mortgages that were in the financial system in 2008. On the left, that, that is the federal government's role in the sense that the federal government owned these mortgages through uh, uh, several uh, federal agencies in 2008. Uh, the blue is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, those are two government-backed, or were then, two government-backed uh, mortgage companies. They didn't make mortgages. They bought mortgages from banks and other financial institutions, other uh, originators of mortgages, and either held them in their portfolios or they guaranteed them and sold them as mortgage-backed securities. So that's the blue. The red is FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, which, is, which was somewhat smaller. Um, and the green is other government agencies. The black is the private sector. So just looking at that, you might begin to wonder how it could be that the private sector was responsible for getting all of these mortgages into the financial system when it had such a relatively small role. What actually this is telling us, if, we ha if I had the percentages um, up there, I, this is just in millions, but if you had the percentages up there, what I would say to you is that um, this represents 54 million mortgages in the United States out of a total of something like a hundred million. So it's more than half of all mortgages in the United States. And 76% of all these subprime or other low quality mortgages in 2008, before the financial crisis, were on the books of government agencies principally Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, those two mortgage companies I told you about. So, first, there, there would be some, some dissonance here uh, between the idea that, well, the private sector was responsible for creating all of these mortgages and the fact that the government was holding 76% of these mortgages. Um, and that, to me, shows that the government created the demand for these mortgages uh, because the ultimate holder or the ultimate guarantor in the case of Fannie and Freddie, it was the government. So without the government having stepped in to do those things, those mortgages would not have been created. Okay, this is just, uh, I've, this is excerpted from a, a report that Fannie May produced of the two of them. Fannie Mae was the larger. Uh, Freddie Mac is somewhat smaller than Fannie Mae, but both of them were trillion dollar companies. Um, they were both listed on the New York Stock Exchange um, and they had private shareholders, of course. Uh, but together, their involvement in the mortgage uh, business was about $5 trillion, either mortgages they held or mortgages that they were exposed to by um, guaranteeing mortgage-backed securities that they issued. And what you can see here, and the reason I put this up here is just to make sure that everybody um, 
uh, gets the, the size of the picture. What you have across the top, negative amortizing loans, uh, interest-only loans, loans with FICO scores less than 620, and I'll explain to you what that means. All, you don't have to look at all of them, but the point is that at the end, in the, in the yellow, at the very end, there's 870, just about $878 billion in those mortgages, which is a little bit more than a third of all the mortgages that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac held. Um, that's just to show you that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were admitting while the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission was in being, that in fact they held all of these mortgages. This table, or the table from which this is excerpted, did not appear in the report of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. So if you are wondering about whether that was a thorough investigation, um, using taxpayer funds to investigate uh, what really caused the financial crisis, you, you should get a pretty good idea about whether it was from this. Okay. Now, these things have real consequences. When the idea is that the, the government, the government's housing policies cause the financial crisis, there's a consequence. When the idea is that the private sector, the financial system in general, banks and others created the financial sector, uh, created the financial crisis, there is a consequence. Ideas have policy consequences. What you're looking at is the result of the conclusion that the financial crisis was caused by the private sector's uh, risk-taking and irresponsibility. Um, and what we see here in the gray, with the black in the middle of it, in the gray, that is all of the recoveries from recessions since the middle 1960s. The red line at the bottom is our most recent recovery since 2008. Um, and why is the most recent recovery so slow in relation to all the others? And the answer is because in 2010, responding to the idea that it was risk-taking by a, an inadequately regulated private sector, Congress adopted something called the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, which is still in being, and which was the most um, repressive, restrictive regulation placed on the private sector, private financial sector, since um, the New Deal. Um, I don't think there is another way to explain why the recovery from the recession was as slow as it was this time, unless you look at the Dodd-Frank Act. And a lot of the debate that we're having right now, and you'll see it in the papers, um, or hear it in the media and so forth, what you hear is, well, if we made any changes in this Dodd-Frank Act, we're gonna have another financial crisis. And why is that? The reason is that um, the private sector was out of control, they weren't sufficiently regulated, and it is the Dodd-Frank Act that is keeping us from having another crisis. Uh, but in fact, the likelihood is we are headed for another crisis, not because we are going to make any changes in the Dodd-Frank Act of any significance, but largely because by not addressing our housing policies, the government's housing policies, we are allowing the same things to happen, and I will get to that in a minute, so that in five to ten years from now, there's a very good chance that we'll, we will be in exactly the same position we were in 2008, and we will have another crisis. Now, well, how did this all come about? How was it that the government got involved in buying all of these terrible mortgages? What I'm showing you here are something called the Affordable Housing Goals. These were adopted in 1992 for the purpose of making sure that uh, people of limited means, low income, moderate income people, were able to get mortgage credit. For many years, up until 1992, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, those two mortgage companies I mentioned before, dominated, and still dominate in fact, the housing finance markets. And they had one strict position on almost everything. 
and that is they would not buy a mortgage that was not a prime mortgage. And what was a prime mortgage? A prime mortgage was normally 10 to 20 percent down payment, uh, a FICO score, which is a credit score of not less than 660, and a debt to income ratio, that is the ratio between what your debts are in relation to your income after the closing of the mortgages, that was not more than 38 percent. So that makes you a pretty, a pretty good mortgage credit. And that was their standard. They were run by the government, they were backed by the government, they were regulated by the government, but they were private companies on the New York Stock Exchange, and so they were interested in profit and stability and so forth, and so they would not acquire subprime mortgages. Congress didn't like that idea because they thought that the reason our, our home ownership rate in the United States was at 64% and had been for 30 year, almost 30 years since the mid-1960s um, was not going up was because moderate and low-income people were not given access to mortgage credit because of the standards that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were putting into place. So the affordable housing goals were an effort to remedy that. And what they were basically was a, a system of quotas. They started out with this. For every mortgage you buy, uh, uh, for all the mortgages you buy in a particular year, 30% uh, of those mortgages have to be made to people who are at or below the median income in the places where they live. Um, that would, would, that was a standard that began in uh, 1993. In 1996, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which was given the authority to adjust those quotas, to pr principally to lift those quotas, began to raise them and, and somewhat aggressively. So what you are looking at here, um, the black line is the quotas in each of these categories. And I'll explain the categories very briefly. The black line is the quotas. And you can see how Fannie and Freddie, the red is Fannie, I think, and the green is Freddie, um, were complying with that increase in the quotas. And by uh, 2008, the main quota, the, the low and moderate income quota, that is anyone below um, median income was low and moderate income, that was 56%. And you can see it on there in the top line. So. That meant that more than 50% of all mortgages Fannie and Freddie bought in any year had to be made to people who were at or below median income. Uh, there, the two other categories just below was one called uh, underserved areas, which were principally minority areas, and special affordable, uh, the, the category yet below that, um, as people who were 80 or 60% of median income. So this was, these were very low. Uh, income groups. And you can see the categories went up in all of those areas, um, but the, uh, it they went up faster, as you can see on the chart, in the underserved areas and the special affordable areas. But nevertheless, even at the highest low and moderate income category at the top, it was 56%. So Fannie and Freddie had to find um, mortgages more than half of all the mortgages they bought had to be made to people below median income, at or below median income. Well, if you think about it, if you're trying to make prime mortgages, which is what they had always done, it was very difficult to find prime mortgages uh, made to people below median income. It's obvious why you don't have to go through all of the demographics and economic elements about that. It's just there. It's harder for people below median income to have the savings and that sort of thing to buy a home um, and to continue to support the home given health problems, divorces, all the sorts of things that often happens. Um, so Fannie and Freddie had to begin reducing their underwriting standards. Now they were the dominant players in our housing finance market. And when, as often happens in any market, where the leading players uh, change their way of doing business, everyone else does the same. Um, 
because it's a competitive market. And Fannie and Freddie were the biggest buyers by far in the market. So if you wanted to sell mortgages to Fannie and Freddie, you had to make the kinds of mortgages Fannie and Freddie wanted. And those mortgages were mortgages made to people at or below median income. And as, and as Fannie and Freddie's quotas went up, they had to keep reducing their underwriting standards. What's the consequence of that? This is a chart from Robert Schiller, a professor at Yale, a very well known, a student of bubbles, housing bubbles, housing booms. This is a chart he prepared. What we are looking at here, the, the, the um, sector below, the lines below, are years from 1975 to 2010. And you see a gigantic uh, bubble there between about 1997 and 2007. Think about it this way. Let's just look at down payments. The down payment requirement, as I said before, for Fannie and Freddie before 1992 was 10% or 20%, and many of your parents um, I know my parents and I had to come up with 10 to 20% down payment to buy our first home. Um, but if you have $10,000 and you've saved up to buy a home, um, you can buy with that underwriting standard a uh, $100,000 home. If the underwriting standard drops to 5%, you can buy a $200,000 home. Instead of borrowing $90,000 to buy that home, you now can borrow $190,000. Two things are true about that. The first is all this additional credit drives up home prices. That's why we began to see the, this enormous bubble that began in 1997. The second thing that happens is that the person who would have used his or her $10,000 to buy a $100,000 home and is now buying a $200,000 home with $190,000 in credit is a weaker financial credit because now he or she has an obligation of $190,000 instead of just $90,000. So two things go on. First of all, housing prices begin to rise. And the second thing is the people who are buying the homes are weaker credits because they are borrowing more to buy the homes. And in fact, by the year 1997, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were accept, accepting mortgages. This wasn't all their mortgages, but they were accepting mortgages with 3% down payment. And by the year 2000, they were accepting mortgages with zero down payment. Again, they had to do this in order to meet the quotas that the government had put on them to acquire mortgages, uh, acquire mortgages from people who are at or below median income. Okay, we then get to 2007 and 2008 and 2007. Housing prices had gotten so high that it was really not possible no matter how concessionary the, um, the lending was, no matter how willing banks were to make concessionary kinds of loans to get you into a house, people couldn't afford the houses. Um, the houses had far outstripped incomes. Housing prices had far outstripped incomes uh, in terms of their cost. And so what would happen in a market like that is people stopped buying. And when people stopped buying, the mortgage market began to fall apart. And what you're seeing here is not the mortgage market as a whole. This is a representative of more, a representation of the mortgage market because what we're looking at is the private mortgage-backed securities market, which was a small part of the market, but was affected substantially by the decline in the end of the bubble and the collapse of the bubble and people staying away from the market. So you can see a very severe drop between about the fourth quarter of 2007 and down to 2008, when in fact, um, there was almost no buying of mortgage-backed securities, just selling by firms that were holding mortgage-backed securities and had to get rid of them at, at a huge loss. Okay, so there we are. This is, this is the obvious way 
that you have something like a financial crisis. You have a lot of institutions in the um, in the in the financial system, private institutions that have bought and are holding either mortgage-backed securities or mortgages themselves, and the market collapses. Um, the economists call this regressing to the mean, um, which means that you just go back to the, the underlying rate that if you looked at it over a century, you'd see an underlying rate of growth. It regresses to that mean, and that's, that's what happened. And the losses throughout the country were 30 to 40 percent, which was far, far in excess of any financial crisis uh, or any, uh, de- any creation and collapse of a, um, of a bubble we've ever had. Just to go back for a moment, you can see two bubbles before that, or booms, or whatever you might want to call them. One was in 1979, and another was in 1989, and those rose and fell. They were kind of like waves on the ocean. They were nothing like what happened between 1997 and 2007. And when that one collapsed, um, something no one in the business had ever seen, and that is a collapse of 30 to 40 percent in mortgage values. The usual collapse was 3 to 4 percent, and it was usually regional. It would happen in Texas, or it would happen in the Midwest, or it would happen in California, but it was never across the country. And the reason, of course, is that Fannie and Freddie did business across the country, and they made these kinds of weak mortgages um, well before anyone, uh, well before anyone even considered what the consequences of that would be. So that in itself uh, did not necessarily cause a financial crisis. I'll go into one more chapter in the book that really explains, I think, more uh, more fully what really happened after that. We have the collapse of this huge um, asset. Mortgages are about $11 trillion, maybe about one-fifth of our economy. Collapse in the value of mor- home mortgages. Many people losing their homes and being unable to keep their homes and, and uh, uh, banks unable to carry these mortgages because they have no value anymore. This is the kind of thing that went on, but that isn't sufficient to explain what happened. Because what actually happened after that were a couple of blunders by our own government. This was the Bush administration um, in 2008, which made things much worse. And that is that in September, in March of 2008, um, a, an institution, uh, a financial institution called Bear Stearns, and many of you may have heard the name, it was a, a Wall Street firm, not a commercial bank, not insured in any way by the government, but a large uh, securities firm, investment firm, um, about $450 billion. But Bear Stearns was one of the heaviest investor in mortgage-backed securities and in the housing market in general. And uh, Bear Stearns was looking very weak, and it seemed as though it would fail. Now, the, the U.S. government has never rescued, with the exception of, of uh, GM and, and uh, Chrysler, has never meant rescued an institu- a financial institution um, other than a bank for which it is responsible anyway, because it is largely insuring the mor- the uh, deposits in banks. But for reasons that are still not entirely clear, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve decided that they would rescue Bear Stearns. And they did it by providing J.P. Morgan Chase, one of the very large mortgage back, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> one of the very large bank holding companies on Wall Street, now the largest bank holding company on Wall Street, um, with uh, some subsidized support to buy Bear Stearns. And they did. Now, what the result of that is that all of the creditors of Bear Stearns, um, and as I say, it was a $450 billion firm, so there were probably 400, at least 400 billion dollars in creditors out there, they were all rescued. They all became 
um, the creditors of J.P. Morgan Chase, this gigantic bank holding company. So they were saved. Now, what would you think if you were the manager of one of these companies? Your, your reaction would be, uh, oh, wait a minute. I don't really have to worry so much about the fact that I, my creditors might run for fear that I'm going to fail because the government actually is going to rescue all the creditors. So if it, if it were different, if the government was not going to rescue the creditors, what financial companies do when they have a problem with a decline in the value of their assets is they go out into the market and they sell more stock. Stock prices were way down. And to sell stock at that point would mean that you'd be diluting all of your shareholders. So what you do is you say, I'm going to try to tough it out because actually my creditors, I don't usually worry about my creditors, but if they leave me, I'm in trouble. So uh, if I can avoid diluting my shareholders by buying more, selling more equity, I'm going to do that. I'm going to wait it out. So very few firms issued new equity in this period because the stock prices were so low and they figured the creditors would be all right. And the creditors thought the same thing. Um, after all, Bear Stearns was a $450 billion company, but it was the smallest of the non-bank, large non-bank financial institutions on Wall Street. And along then comes um, the, the early, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, the later years, uh, the later part of 2008, September of 2008, and the Treasury Department then takes over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Now, that's understandable because they were government-backed and government's responsible for them anyway, and they're in serious trouble because of all the bad mortgages they had bought. So Treasury Department took over uh, the operations of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But to the market, that was a real shock because nobody knew that Fannie Mae and Freddie, at least nobody seemed to know that Fannie and Freddie were buying mortgages that were not prime mortgages. People assumed that they had always continued their traditional business of only buying prime mortgages. And when the Treasury had to take them over, the assumption of many people and many investors was, oh my God, this is not a subprime mortgage problem. We have a, a problem among prime mortgages. And they ran from all kinds of financial institutions in the first week of September 2008. When that happened, then people looked at Lehman Brothers. Lehman Brothers was the next largest uh, non-bank financial institution on Wall Street, and that was about 50% larger than Bear Stearns. And so everyone assumed, okay, Lehman Brothers will be taken over by the government. It will be, someone will be paid by the government to take control of Lehman Brothers, just as J.P. Morgan Chase was paid to take control of Bear Stearns. But at that point, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, whose name was Hank Paulson, lost his nerve, and he said he would not bail out Lehman, uh, Lehman Brothers. So Lehman Brothers was allowed to fail to the shock of everyone in the market. So we had two terrible things happen within a very short period of time. The, the collapse of, the, of, the, of mortgage prices in the United States, which put all kinds of financial institutions in trouble, and then the government first indicating that it was going to save the large institutions and then failing to do so, and that caused the chaos that followed the failure of Lehman Brothers, a chaos, the chaos which we now call the financial crisis. So that, that's the story. Um, that's not a story you have heard. Um, it's not a story you are ever likely to hear um, because there's just nothing but this book telling this story. And it tells it with an awful lot of data that I collected while I was at the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and after I was at the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission when all of their files, oh, most of their files, became available um, to the public and I was able to learn things that I hadn't seen or, or learned when I was a member of the commission. So that is the story of the financial crisis uh, and you can see how 
what I'll call a false narrative that the financial crisis was caused by um, excessive risk taking on Wall Street can easily turn into um, bad legislation, which happened. The so-called Dodd-Frank Act and the bad legislation caused a very slow recovery of our economy. And you might, depending on whether you like Donald Trump or not, you might well say, well, it was the slow, slow recovery of the economy from the financial crisis that resulted in Donald Trump's election. Because so many parts of this country are filled with people who were unable to get jobs. And uh, even if they had a job, did not have the kinds of increases in income that they had become accustomed to because of this very slow recovery. So we have it all. We have an odd situation in which people are not fully informed about how they got in, we got into a financial crisis. Because they were not fully informed, they watched Congress impose tough regulation on the financial system. The tough regulation caused a very slow recovery and brought us to the position we are in today. So thanks very much for your attention. I gather there will be questions or can be questions and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I think you're right. I think we're all moving towards still looking back at, at what actually happened. Um, in what way, uh, without getting too much into the specifics, would you say that Dodd Frank has been a drag on the recovery? It uh, has imposed huge regulatory costs, principally on smaller banks, uh, community banks. And the, actually, the community banks are the source of a lot of the vitality in our economy. Um, because community banks are the ones that um, support startups in their communities. Uh, whether these are three smart guys who are in... Um, artificial intelligence or any other new area, or whether it is just the corner grocery store or the barbershop. All of these startups are the ones who employ. And that's where most of the employment comes from, is from new startups locally. And then our bigger business also, bigger businesses also come from that. After a period of time, the successful ones grow and grow and grow, and they are able to um, have, perhaps have a public offering and become the very largest kinds of companies. That's where I think the rubber hits the road with the Dodd-Frank Act. Not only does it generally, is it punitive um, in, in terms of risk taking, which would affect all companies, and it is that, but it's when it imposed so much, uh, so many additional regulatory costs on small banks that they had to pay a lot in order to um, hire uh, lawyers and other people who handle these uh, regulations for them. And uh, with those additional costs, many of them went out of business. Many of them merged because they couldn't afford to, to pay for all of this new regulation. Um, and others just uh, stopped making the kinds of loans that they were making before because they just didn't have the additional funds uh, to do that. So that, I think, is really where it hits most squarely at our economy. And um, I think at, at the moment, I'm, I think, even though the Dodd-Frank Act may not be substantially amended because of opposition to it, and the opposition comes almost entirely from people who believe that if we eliminated or reduced Dodd-Frank, we would have another financial crisis because they don't know what really caused the financial crisis. Um, but I think if to the extent we're having any sense of growth now, it's because the business community thinks, well, maybe regulation is going to uh, decline somewhat. And we'll be able to we'll be able to get a sense of what is going to happen in the future. We'll make more investments, and that's why the stock market is up. But I'm I'm not so sure about that or how long it will last. But I think that's that's where Dodd Frank has caused 
um, the uh, adverse conditions in our economy. Yes, in the back. Any time you do post mortem on a major problem, whether it's an airplane crash or a ship crash or whatever, what you normally do is try to identify who was responsible, what first or group of people brought about the situation. And in this case, um, the uh, problem that you described occurred over a period of at least a decade, maybe a decade and a half across two different administrations of Democratic and Republican administration. Putting aside that the buck stops with Bill Clinton and George Bush, there were actually people who were moving this process in the direction of describing. Other than 1,500 GS-15s <laughs> got on board or, or whatever, can you identify who you think is responsible for setting the course that you describe as, you know, creating? Well, yeah, I mean, you really have to, uh, it's not just creating, but it's also sustaining the system. Yeah. And I, I look at the, Dodd, uh, well, I'm sorry, I, I look at the affordable housing goals as the problem. And they were widely supported in Congress, and the principal supporters were Dodd, who was a senator at the time, and Frank, who was a congressman at the time. And, and it is ironic that they are also the sponsors of the legislation that has suppressed the economy. But the idea was, at the time that, that, the, uh, uh, that the affordable housing goals were adopted, was that we are going to help sectors of this economy, people in this economy, who are unable to get the credit to buy homes perfectly good idea. We'd love to be able to make it easier for people to buy homes, but they chose the wrong method for doing that. Congress, led by these two um, powerful senators and congressmen, um, led by this, led by those two, they chose the wrong way of doing it because they took the two agencies that were responsible for setting the underwriting standards in the economy and force them to reduce their underwriting standards. Did, did both administrations, uh, both yes. Administrations supported or acquiesced? They acquiesced or supported. Um, everyone loved what was going on because there was an increase in the home ownership rate in the United States. I said at the beginning that the home ownership rate in the United States was was stalled at sixty five percent between the middle of 1965 and about the middle of 1995. It was stalled and people were really frustrated by that. And, and, and no one opposed it? No. I mean, there might have been some opposition at the time, but Congress seemed very willing to impose these quotas on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And there were community activists who were very eager to get this done, and they got it done. So you have to blame Congress and not the people who enforced it. Everyone was happy when the home ownership rate was going up. And in his, in his autobiography, uh, Bush said, um, we were all, basically what I said, we were all very happy to see the home ownership rising. What we didn't understand was that we were creating tremendous risks at the same time. Yes. I'm just going to, if I may, just offer it and it's part of the question. That, that same time period, 97, 98, part of, the, part of my practice involved lobbying registrations. And Frank Rank was splashing a lot of money around <laughs> town, hiring every politically connected lobbyist there right. was in ways that so much so that I thought, what's going on? What are they covering up? Because I've been around the town long enough to uh, yeah. see that as an indicator. I'm wondering if that's interesting. Um, no, actually, not. I didn't really spend a lot of time on that but for the audience. Frank Raines was the chairman of the board of Fannie Mae, which was the biggest of these organizations, and was also a very powerful organization. I, I started criticizing Fannie Mae when I first went to the American Enterprise Institute because I, I'm a free market type. And this was, this was wrong because the way it was working is the government was backing this company that was a private, basically a private company with private shareholders, 
who were making a lot of money. The managements were also making a fortune. And it was known that if the company ever failed, the taxpayers were going to have to bail them out. Now, that is wrong. And so I criticized that them for many, many years, well before the financial crisis. And that's probably why I was chosen to be a member of this financial crisis inquiry commission. But um, Fannie Mae was a powerful company, maybe the most powerful company in the United States in the 1990s and the early 2000s because it was so gigantic and because it was right in the heart of things and it hired a lot of important people in Washington, put them on the board or just paid them um, well to represent them here in Washington. And just to tell you a little story, when I was um, when I first went to in the American Enterprise Institute, uh, a friend of mine called me and said, well, what are you, you going to study? What are you going to do now that you've retired from law practice and you're at, at this think tank? And I said, well, I'm going to look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because I'm really worried about that. And he said, you're going to look at Fannie Mae? And I said, yes. And he said, do you have someone to start your car in the morning? <laughs> so, I mean, they were very retaliatory. And many people stayed away from criticizing them because they would ruin your law practice or they would ruin some other practice for you if you criticize them. They were not, they did not give any quarter. Yes, sir. Um, so that points to uh, an important component that you sort of alluded to, which is that there's a financial literacy problem, right? I mean, the, the regulatory side of it certainly, you know, creates mm -hmm. all the incentives, but people should know that they may, should not take on the extra uh, 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 loan. Um, so I guess who do you think is doing a good job of that public education part, um, and what incentive is there to do that public education part? Because it seems that in order to get these good policies through, like the Choice Act, or to repeal Dodd Frank, or to make sure that Dodd Frank was right in the first place, you need to sort of create a, a group of people who are willing to sign on to it. And it doesn't seem like your average American, <laughs> you know, is aware of it because they want to see the bank system. No, that's true. That's true. I, I'm a little pessimistic about this, actually, um, uh, because it's very, very hard for anyone to uh, recognize what the dangers are in the middle of what is essentially a bubble. Um, and in fact, one of the chapters I have in the book is about a guy who was a financial advisor. And uh, he was doing very well. He's working for Merrill Lynch, and he was making a lot of money. And he decided he wanted to buy a new home. This is an amazing story. It's all in there because it was all public. He, he talk, talked about this for a magazine. And he, he went to see a, um, an agent to buy a home. And the home, home was pretty expensive. But the agent said, look, you don't have to put anything down. And he said, well, gee, I mean, why would I not have to make a down payment. Agent said, no, I can, I can take care of this. You can buy this home and you don't have to make a down payment. <laughs> and this is a financial advisor. And he said, well, you know, the guy, if, if someone's going to buy my mortgage and I don't have to put anything down, why am I worried? Um, I'm, why shouldn't I do this? And he did it, of course. He bought the house. And then, of course, it turned out that the home prices collapsed and he didn't have any equity in the home and all the homes in his area collapsed and he couldn't and he his job was reduced he didn't earn as much from Merrill Lynch as an advisor and he couldn't hold the home and he had to even though he didn't pay a down payment he still had a monthly payment to make on his mortgage and he lost his home and so it is just interesting that people who are educated already don't see the dangers of taking on these mortgages um, when housing prices continue to rise. And so the lenders didn't see it, and the borrowers didn't see it, and Fannie and Freddie just kept the, kept the game going until everything fell apart. Yes, sir? Well, the reports that I remember reading were about people who, who um, they were trying to get the borrower was qualified to take on the loan. When clearly the borrower is not qualified. And it seems to me that that's a crucial point at which people got into trouble. And of course, then with rising prices, more and more people were anxious to do not specifically what they do would get them into trouble, but which in fact would get them into trouble. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. 
people made these decisions that they probably suspected was going to get them into trouble. And the question is, well, why would someone make a loan to someone who was obviously not going to be able to meet his or her obligations? And the answer is, this is not my problem. I'm going to sell it to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. And I'm going to make money on that. But the person who is evaluating the qualification is clearly being dishonest. Well, it's not, it, it, it's dishonest in one sense. You're not required to be honest with people. You are, they are supposed to be honest with themselves. Now you can turn it around and say that the lender has an obligation to make sure that the borrower can pay back, but we've always thought Lenders would not make loans that borrowers couldn't pay back. And the unusual thing here was that there was another buyer who didn't care. And that was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So you could then be a lender and you could look at the people across the table and say, these people are not going to be able to meet this obligation. But then on the other hand, you might say, we're in the middle of this, uh, housing prices are going up. These people are buying an asset that is going to be worth 10% more next year than it's worth right now. Um, if they keep it for two, if they can make the payments for two or three years, they're going to have an asset that is worth 30% more than what they're paying right now. So they're not crazy to do this. It's only when we look at it in hindsight and we see that, in fact, they couldn't even get through the first year of paying on this, on the mortgage, that we realize that it was not it was something foolish for them to do. Tulips. Right. Tulip bulbs. Right. And, uh, and those have been going on for a long time. And people should realize when you're in a bubble that you are in a bubble. You know, this, this, this professor um, at Yale, um, I forgot, is uh, Schiller, Bob Schiller. Um, he studies bubbles. He studies bubbles. And um, he writes a lot about bubbles. And it's, psych it's deeply psychological. But there is, there is something to be said about this. And he wasn't able to tell that we were in a bubble. He thought, well, we probably were in a bubble. But the way you could tell, this he was writing in the mid-1980s, well before 2008, like 2004, 2005. And he was saying the way... I think that we probably are in a bubble is because if you study the reason people are buying, people would, are telling pollsters that they're buying because the asset is going to be, the house is going to be worth more the next year. And so that's a, that's a bubble mentality. That's how he looks at it. Um, but it is only one way to devise that. But most, most of the time, you don't know when you're in the middle of a bubble that you are. Uh, you think, and there were plenty of things published at the time. I read a lot of them because I'm interested myself in this. And, were, and the publications at the time were saying, well, you know, we have a growing economy here. And people are buying second homes and third homes. Um, and, you know, beach properties and things like that. Uh, and the question is, when, when that is happening, is this reality? If it's reality, then I ought to get on the train and go along. And if, if they could foresee that in 2008 everything was going to fall apart, you would then say, well, it wasn't reality. Then they were foolish for doing this. But it's very hard to blame anyone um, for in the middle of a bubble like that um, to be able to out really tell that things are going to collapse. So it's the, the, the people who are responsible are not the people who borrowed the money to buy the homes not the lenders who lent them the money to buy the homes. It was, in my view, it was Congress setting up a system in which the government, in effect, was forcing down the quality of the mortgages and then themselves helping the bubble along by buying all of these mortgages and increasing housing prices by doing that. Woo. <laughs> Got a lot of questions here. <laughs> Florida, it took about five years to clear the, more, the foreclosures. Uh-huh. I mean, the, the, the courts were just crowded. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And uh, look, there's some that aren't cleared yet. Some people still have foreclosed homes they're living in. Uh, yes, sir. So, sorry, you said um, we uh, 
rather find his money. So that's an assumption, I believe. But, um, you know, how is it going to happen if it's going to happen? Is it the same fashion that in 2008? Yep. Is it, what measures are we taking? And are we in the bubble right now? And how we know? Like that. We don't know. But, but uh, that, that little chart doesn't go far enough along. But at AEI, we're doing studies on this. And we're about, if this were the 2010s, um, we're about here. So the prices have gone up about that much. And they have, then the, the real bubble mentality has not really started. But why is that happening is the question. Why, why is this going on? And that's because of government housing policy. And the reason it works that way is that the government is making very concessionary loans. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac right now, at the request of the Obama administration, um, are accepting 3% down payment um, mortgages. Now, when that happens, that means people are borrowing 97% of the value of the home in order to buy it. And when you do that, it pushes up the cost of the homes, and that's why home prices are rising. And they will continue to rise as long as the government insists on making these very concessionary loans with hardly any down payment at all. Um, and we're headed into uh, exactly the same situation where eventually the bubble gets out of control because people begin to realize, and in some areas this is already true, you've got 10% increases in the value of homes in the area. And so people think it's a really great investment to go in and get that home that you've always wanted. And the bank will lend you 97% um, in order to do it. Uh, and then, of course, we're, we're setting ourselves up for exactly the same problem five or 10 years from now. And the, all, and the reason for this is, is that we misdiagnosed the real cause of the crisis in the first place. So we attacked Wall Street and the financial system and we left untouched the mortgage uh, and housing finance system in the United States. It's simple as that. Uh, yes, sir. I, I heard, I heard uh, Mr. Greenspan was, was, at the time, very optimistic and the attitude of uh, some of the So um, do you think he, he or uh, Ben or Mr. Ben might be responsible for the bubble? I didn't hear the last second part of your. Ah, my evaluation of that, yes. Okay. Um, well, turning first to Greenspan, um, he was. For part of this time, for in the in the 1990s, and into the early 2000s, he was the head of the Fed, and um, he did not complain about the rise in home prices. But again, uh, my view is anyone, if I'd been in that position, I wouldn't have complained about it either, because you don't know what underlying cause is. There are several things going on here that nobody knew, including Greenspan, because I know him pretty well, and we've talked about it since. Nobody knew. I say nobody, but very, very few people knew that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were buying non-prime or sub-prime mortgages. They didn't say it, and in their reports to the SEC, they said our exposure to subprime mortgages is less than 1% or minimal. And I showed you the chart that that is not less than 1%. And that's, these are the mortgages that are subprime and otherwise weak mortgages, and they have $838 billion worth. That's not less than 1% of their total. And so they were not telling the truth. Um, but in, it, it was really not entirely clear to everybody what they were doing, and nobody knew. Nobody understood how many subprime mortgages were actually in the market. Even if Alan Greenspan had known this, even if the Fed had known 
how many subprime mortgages there were, they wouldn't have been able to do anything about it because Congress was delighted and, Bo and the administration, the Bush administration and the Clinton administration before it was delighted that home ownership was going up and they didn't understand what the risks were. So that's, that's the story. They, we couldn't have stopped this. Once it gets started, there's just not enough knowledge for people actually to stop it. On the question of the Obama administration, I think they made things worse by, back, by accepting fully and wholeheartedly the idea that it was Wall Street that caused the problem without trying to find out what really caused the problem. And so they suppressed the growth of the economy and didn't do anything about the housing problem. In the back. I, I have, I'm going to have some trouble with that because I'm not really fully accustomed, I'm not fully conversant in international stuff, but a lot of the mortgages that were sold in the United States through mortgage-backed securities were bought by European institutions. And that was in part because for many, many years, um, uh, an American mortgage was thought to be a gold standard kind of investment because Americans always paid their mortgages. And even in bad times, hard, we are hardly ever had a time where more than 1% defaults occurred. And so people saw all these American mortgages coming onto the market. They had always been great investments. They were paying good returns. And so Europeans individually and European financial institutions bought lots and lots of them. And that caused a lot of trouble for the Europeans when the American market went south. Yes, sir. Uh, just to follow up on the last question, uh, you know, it's true that there are repercussions of the 2008 crash. The global, and particularly uh, Europe, was affected, you know. Uh, as we all know, the finances of the European Union today are very precarious. Particularly, uh, recently, the situation in Italy threatens to turn to another Greece. Uh, we try to uh, speculate what might be the, the consequences of, uh, let's say, that kind of a crash, which is 10 times as big as, as Greece. Right. On the, uh, the American financial markets and could this perhaps be the fit that makes the stock I can't really do that if effectively. I, I, I think if Italy were to collapse financially, it will have a major effect in Europe. I doubt that will have much of an effect here in the United States because if it had been sudden that Italy collapsed, you know, without any ex expectation of this happening. We'll say, say there was an election in Italy and they elected um, Maduro from uh, uh, Venezuela as their president. Um, that would be a real shock to the markets, even in the United States. It would upset all kinds of expectations. But I think at this point, um, advisors to the banks and other financial institutions here probably understand that there could be a serious problem in Italy and we've uh, we're no longer exposed to it in a variety of ways. You can buy various kinds of swaps that will protect you. You can sell off your assets that are based in Italy, things like that. So I doubt that it would have any effect here. It will have obviously a major effect in Europe. And at some point they have to come to terms with the fact that the euro um, isn't working for everyone except Germany. And as long as, and, and the Germans are doing great because the euro is low uh, because it has to cover a lot of other countries. And so their products are very low and they uh, have a huge surplus, trade surplus as a result of that. Um, but at some point um, when you know, un un unless the Italians learn to work like Germans, it's not going to work. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm sorry? Depends are doing fairly well. Yeah, probably. The Northern Europeans are doing well. Yes, sir? Uh, I have a question about uh, if you're using your book, uh, Austrian economics or something like that, if it's something that I read a lot after the crisis, a lot of people talking about Austrian school, Hayek, um, I don't put it in the book because I really don't deal with economics in the book, except except um, it's the, sort of the light motif of the book, and that is that if you get the government involved in a market, it is going to collapse eventually because of the uh, the government's um, purposes and 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 desires and the political pressures that government exerts, um, and Hayek and and. Uh, uh, several other members of the uh, Austrian school uh, would preach that, and I'm basically a follower of that approach. Although I am not an economist, I am just a lawyer. But that's the that's the story. We we are not following orthodox economic standards. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Vancouver, and I think maybe a few other cities have identified the inflow of foreign money into the housing markets as driving the problem. Do you see that influx of foreign money having much of a role in the next bubble year? Or is it just going to be very limited to certain specific markets? Um, there was a, a, a lot of that uh, speculated about when people were trying to figure out why we had this bubble. And uh, many people said, well, it was because there was so much saving in China and they didn't have any place to um, put that saving so they it poured in from all of these developing countries into the United States and that caused the housing bubble. There was never any explanation for why it would be in the housing market as opposed to something else. Um, but I did do a study of that. It's in the book and I looked at interest rates in the United States and there was a slight lowering of interest rates during the time when the bubble was coming in, but not enough really for anyone, at least like me, to believe that this huge dump of foreign savings into the United States really caused uh, the, the, the uh, bubble here. Um, interest rates actually were fairly stable for most of the years when, um, when the bubble was, was rising. It, they were 4%, 5% on the 10-year treasury. Nothing, nothing tremendously changed during this period, and uh, so I, I, I just discounted that as a, as a cause. The cause was what the government was doing. That forced down underwriting standards created this enormous bubble, and that's a really simple way of looking at it, and that's how I think it happened. And there was nothing, nothing foreign associated with it. It's all our fault. Yes? Um. I think there's, as you know, there's sort of a rich library of books. Uh, Jillian Peck from Financial Times, Scott Patterson, Michael Lewis, about all of this. And in fact, a lot of them do really hammer Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, Frank Rains, etc. Um, in retrospect, isn't it more complex than one? There may have been, you know, a major driver, but it was kind of a perfect storm of greed, at, at excessive greed at every level, in the sense that your average person was trying to use their house as a piggy bank, uh, the mortgage originators were fraudulent in massive Southern California, certain regions. Then the banking houses were churning all that garbage into exotic vehicles like collateralized, synthetic collateralized debt obligations. And then another segment of the financial specialists were creating things, were betting against it, uh, the market to fail. And so I actually had an interest to stirring up all the skepticism and apprehension that finally led to the big meltdown. So, and then, you know, of course you have the politicians that never want to say no. So in a way, um, I certainly respect the research with regard to Freddie Mac. You know, I think there can't be heaped up enough <coughs> opprobrium, but they weren't alone. And frank and truthfully, looking back on it, I think a lot of us here were, you know, 
functional adults during that period and recollect it. I think everybody knew everybody was going crazy. And it was just, could you get in and out quick enough to kind of have, and everybody finally, all the greed aside, had the rug pulled out of them from under them when the uh, TARP and QE2 devaluated the month, the little bit of money maybe the average person did manage to take out of the whole madness. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying is it really is, are we likely to see that kind of perfect storm? Well, we always have bubbles, we know that. But if the, that huge thing was madness all the way around. Right, and look, this is, the, this is one of the counter arguments but I've made this argument just now in, in all my answers to the questions, and that is that people responded in a particular way to what they saw was happening. The market housing prices were going up tremendously quickly. It was a great opportunity. You could call that greed, or you could call that smart investment, or you could call that any number of other things. It's human nature. And the, the, what happened was that the government set, because of its policies, I'm not saying it was only the government, but when the government establishes policies that cause all of these things to be rational activities, we then have this crisis. And, and yeah, so you can say, oh, well, you have only one cause. Well, it is actually only one cause because our economy has gone along since, well, we'll say the 1930s. And, and if you believe what I believe, the, even the 1930s were a problem of the government. It was that uh, the, the most recent analysis by the Friedman and Schwartz is that it was the Fed's policies that caused the depression of the 1930s. That was the government's involvement. And most economists now believe that. But um, you, you, can, you can understand that when you have things happening that cause people to believe that things are going to get better and better over time, that they will take actions that, that, uh, that do that. And so, and there's almost nothing that can cause uh, the kind of crisis that we had, except, given the size of our economy, except the government doing something very large. After the 1930s, we, we had a whole series of recessions and that sort of thing right up until 2008, but nothing like 2008. And why was that? Because largely, the government stayed out of the business. And in the housing business, to the extent the government was involved at all, it was allowing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to set underwriting standards that kept the mortgage market stable. They, it was unfair for them to have that advantage. It was unfair for the government to be backing them, but they kept the mortgage stable because they insisted on prime mortgages. And once that, um, that particular standard was eliminated by government policy, and what, what do they say? Katie barred the door. And that's, and that's what happened. Uh, anything else? I've tired you all out. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kevin.